Hi again, this is our second episode. I'm Ryan. And I'm Dawn, and this is Roll for Initiative. So we had a great first episode and a lot of fun and some really good feedback. Uh, this time through we're going to talk about miniatures and using them, the reasons to use them, the reasons why you maybe don't want to. Dawn's going to talk about getting into character from a player point of view, and I'll talk about the getting into character, I hate air quotes, as a game master. I do think it's important to note for my own sake that it's been a while and yes, the mustache unfortunately is gone. But it lives on in shirt form. Alright, so first off, miniatures. Personally, I really like the use of miniatures and there's some good reasons why some people don't. Um, you can always say that, you know, what people come up with in your head is certainly much better than what you would see on the table in front of you. And that's pretty fair. But there's some really great reasons to use them. First of all, just painting the miniatures in and of itself can be really fun. After that, there's the idea of being able to have a tactical overview of what's happening. The idea of, is someone being flanked, is a lot easier to tell whenever you see the goblin and then the two heroes standing next to them. It also helps from another player's standpoint because the way you paint your miniature is a representation of your character. It's like giving the other players a picture of your character. It gives them an insight into, okay, what does this other person look like? What might be that person's favorite color? Little tiny things that kind of make a more well-rounded character. And if you do feel a little bit artsy, or maybe you've got a new player that's joining your group, or it's just something you really enjoy doing, it can make a really great, fairly inexpensive, geeky little gift during the holidays or for birthdays. This happens to be one of the wolf characters that we made for a friend of ours who plays a ranger. I spent a couple of hours painting it. I thought it'd be really fun, and that way there's also a physical representation on the field between the character and their companion. Overall, it's a great way to get a feel for what's happening on the field, so to speak. And there's some different maps or just kind of sheets that you lay out. You can use dry erase markers or wet erase markers, and you're able to sketch out where buildings are, where mountains are, where the entrance is, and you can literally move around the field. Now personally, I think it works a lot better in your sort of low and high fantasy settings, such as you know, Pathfinder and Dungeons and Dragons. We don't use it in our Shadowrun campaign um, because so little of that campaign is actual fights where it's important where things are standing. That's a lot more of the role-playing aspect of playing a character and interacting with other characters. And we recently did have a Shadowrun campaign, which is actually my first time GMing a Shadowrun campaign, where we did have maps that were the layout of each floor of a building that was being infiltrated. And the maps were pretty helpful. But even then, we didn't use miniatures. It was just good to know where was someone standing. You also don't have to use miniatures all the time during your campaign. Oftentimes we'll use minis when we're in battles so that you can make those quick judgments of, okay, I'm flanking this person. I'm going to cross over here and close with this person. When we're just, okay, we're traveling from point A to point B, we may not end up using the minis. So overall, they're a great way to get a representation of the flow of battle, but it's not something that you have to have. Minis are a tool in your gaming toolbox. Use them if you want to, but if it's getting awkward and problematic, don't use them. It's just a tool. It's not required. Granted, we talk about Shadowrun and Pathfinder a lot, and it's not because we think they're the best systems or they're the only systems that we play, but it's the two major campaigns we have right now. There's tons of others, and we're going to talk about those. We're going to Gen Con soon. Woo, Gen Con! And we'll be able to come back with a lot more systems in mind, and we'll talk about those. One of the major aspects about pen and paper RPG is getting into character. You're not playing you. It might be a version of you, but it's probably not exactly you. So we had a comment on our last video asking about how to get into character. Lucy Lou 42 wanted to know some tips on to how to get into character and how to do the role-playing aspect of gaming. 
which can be difficult. Some of the best advice that we've gotten and that we've implemented and given others has been really know your character's backstory. Now, as a game master, I like to give out a list of five or six questions that the player should be able to answer. Where were you born? What was your family like? How do you feel about the city or kingdom or government that you live in? But then some really fun ones like, what's your favorite dessert? And why do you use the weapon that you use? Now maybe the fact that my character loves key lime pie never comes up. But if it ever does, it's going to be a really great personalized moment in that session. And knowing that backstory, you'll be able to make choices. In a recent campaign, we had a piece of history come up, and my character had a family member who died in that event, so she reacted much more strongly to that event than if I didn't have any backstory or any connection for that character to that event. Something else to consider is how much you prepare. And that's kind of a part of getting into character as a game master. How much you prepare can vary depending on the type of game that you have. When I run a fantasy system, I prepare a lot. I make maps, I have flashcards of what all of the different bad guys might be like. I have my uh, tablet as well as books open. I'm able to cross-reference everything. But when I run my Shadowrun campaigns, I have maybe 50% of it figured out. I know what the NPCs are going to do and what's happening on the timeline regardless of what the players are doing. Everything else, I kind of just pull out of thin air. That allows me to adapt to what the characters are doing. When Dawn's character reacted really strongly to a family member dying in the historical event, I had to think on my feet and come up with a compelling reason why she even agreed to go on the run. And that led to some pretty interesting <laughs> character development later on in the night. It doesn't mean I wasn't prepared, it just means that I was adaptable as a game master in telling the story. In addition to coming up with a background for your character, there are other little tricks that you can use to get into character you can use a specific voice or accent for your character. And that can be really helpful because in addition to helping you kind of get into, okay, who is this character? How do they speak? It also lets the other players at the table know when you're speaking in-game and when you're just making a goofy comment or commenting on something completely unrelated to the game. And yes, let's be honest. It will sound a little funny and feel a little funny to speak in a dialect especially if maybe you're not so good at it. But that's okay, because if you have a character that has a thick Russian accent, after a little while you're going to embrace the fact that you feel a little funny doing it, and maybe come up with things you never would have come up with speaking in your own voice. At the end of the day, we're using a pencil, a sheet of paper, and a bunch of dice to pretend to be killing dragons or navigating the matrix in order to bring down a megacorp. We're already doing something kind of goofy, so just embrace the fact that we're here to have fun. A friend of ours has a really cool trick. He puts together a playlist for each character. Hmm. So he will listen to that music before the session, and that helps him get into the mindset of, okay, this is all the music that this character listens to. And for him, that really lets him connect to who that character is. In addition to being a great way to switch, he can be playing multiple campaigns and multiple characters and have a better way of keeping track of the characters. And always, 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 as much as you can, take inspiration from what's happening around you. We're going to be at Gen Con, and I'm cosplaying as one of my characters. And so I got a pretty ridiculous t-shirt that looks like it could be a th troll thrash metal band shirt. From that one t-shirt, our game master came up with a whole backstory just because of a goofy tag that was hanging off of a kind of douchey t-shirt that I bought at a thrift store. Taking inspiration from your friends, what's around you, what you ordered from lunch that day are all ways of adding some depth 
to the story that you're either running or taking part in. And that inspiration can be characters you know. My first character was inspired partially by a couple of TV characters that I really liked. I was like, oh, I want to play a thief. What are some really great thief characters I've seen on TV? I can kind of use that to help mold and shape it. So I could use those characters as a little bit of, okay, I really like these characters. How do they act? How do they talk? Another great suggestion I heard was having kind of a tick for your character. So some little thing, either a phrase that they always say, um, a movement they always do. And that just is, again, a little something that you can connect with that character. The uh, suggestion was specifically mentioning that somebody had their character spoke with an Aussie accent and always said, good day, mate. Um, and, you know, that ended up launching into having other inside jokes in the group, and it really helped that person connect with who that character was. It's something that knits the experience together and helps express how the person's feeling at the time. Most of all, I think the background of your character is going to be the most helpful for getting into character. There are tons of lists out there. Some campaigns already have lists of questions to ask to get into character somewhere in their books. Uh, Shadowrun has a long list of like 50 questions in the Runner's Companion that I went through and did for one of my characters and found that really helpful. There are also just general questions to ask. We talked about a few of them. Just little tiny details that will help you figure out who this person is. You don't have to answer every question about who your person is. Answer a handful of basic and a couple of detailed questions and then give yourself permission to make stuff up as they come to life. And you might find that starting out, it's a little cl clunky. I found it a little clunky starting out, um, just trying to figure out who's this character, how does this character react, how do I say, how do I role play? Do I use a voice? Do I say, and Tala says, da 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 da. There's a trial and error. And if you're in a group that everyone is new to gaming, everyone's going to be a little clunky. If you're the one new person in the group, everyone's going to understand. So thanks for joining us for this second episode of Roll for Initiative. Remember to subscribe and like and share on Facebook, all that fun stuff and leave us some comments down below. You could be like Lucy Lou 42 and your question will be what we answer next time. Next episode will be about Gen Con. We'll be filming at Gen Con and talking about all the things that we see and experience at Gen Con as well as new games that we find. You might even get to see us and a friend of ours from our regular group in some of our Shadowrun cosplay. So you don't want to miss that. Thanks for watching. Roll for initiative.